Testing. Yes. Hello. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh, sorry. Uh, 45. But I, I can take some practical things while waiting, I think. So we have a photographer here today. Uh, is anyone not uh, interested in being part of a photo in the audience? Uh, please sit, s raise your hand. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to highlight you, but perhaps we can have some uh, sit over here and we won't take photos over there. Over there, I mean. <laughs> Great idea. Um, but of course, these pictures won't be used for big campaigns on the city buses in Malmö. It will be perhaps presented in a presentation, perhaps uh, in some kind of web page at some po point. If that is the case, of course, you know where to find us. We would remove it if you don't want it to be there. Right. Um, are we ready? Okay, I'm going off stage and start with the entire team. And big hand to Benny. Thank you. So, so happy to be back. Uh, I want to start with uh, apologizing, or not really. It has been a while. Uh, I'm very happy that we're doing this again. Uh, I kind of feel that what we initially imagined is happening, that this is a place for some people to meet uh, that are not usually meeting, and that's the whole idea behind Data Alliance. However, I also want to shame you, because the reason that we are not meeting that often is that this is Johnny's third time, and that was not the idea. The idea is that you should come here and speak. I'm sure you have interesting things to say, so please do. This should be a safe place. Uh, you can present whatever, in whatever format. It doesn't have to be pixel perfect. I'm quite sure we might see evidence of that today. Um, anyway, uh, so happy to do this. Uh, Johnny will start. Uh, I have seen 25% of his uh, presentation. I'm dying to see the rest. Give him a round of applause. The microphone. Will this work? Probably should have tried this out before. My computer. It's a good start. Oh wait, wait, wait! Now, please don't say. It. Tell me that it's a mirror. All right. So this is mirroring. I don't want mirror. This is. No, don't, don't. I have too many secrets here. Uh, you'll just have to. Wait, like this. Uh, that's good enough to get started, at least. All right. Um, hi, and welcome to this presentation I'm going to hold. I titled it Speak Uncertainty with Confidence. My name is Johnny. I work with data, uh, whatever shape or form you might have it. Uh, and today I'm going to be presenting something like a, a new concept that I've been thinking about for quite a while. Um, it's going to be a little bit rough in the edges, on the edges, because um, I haven't. Uh, it's still something like I'm cooking in my brain, but I just wanted. I felt like this would be a good place to just air it out and see what people think. Um, so please bear with me, um, and I would love to hear any thoughts or feedback you might have afterwards. So let's get into. The agenda. Um, it's a little bit uh, skewed to the one side, but I hope you can see. Um, I'm going to go through five different things. Um, the key takeaways first. Oh, uh, yeah, that's not misspelled. It just looked weird. Uh, key takeaways first, just to, s to set their um, expectations so you know what you're going to be listening to, listening to about. Uh, and then intro, just introducing some some concepts just uh, so we all are in the kind of the same uh, foundation to understand the rest of the uh, talk. Then the average data intervals, we'll get into what these mean. 
And then lastly, I'll present the key takeaways again, and hopefully you'll uh, find it that you, you have learned what I hope that you've learned. Uh, so let's get into it. Key takeaways. Um, so there, there, it's two things that I'm going to be mainly presenting or th that I want to build into. Uh, the first one is doubt averages. I find averages to be lackluster. They, they, they don't communicate as much as we might think they do. And I'll present why I think that way. And then I'll go into data intervals, which is this new concept that I was talking about. Um, the, the name is not uh, entirely perfect. I'm still working on that. Uh, but I hope that at least the concept will come across to you guys. Um, but with that, let's get into the intro. So um, the one thing I want to just uh, talk about before getting to the meat of the presentation is distributions, uh, more specifically probability distributions. These are things that describe the likelihood of w it, what things that are going to happen in a specific scenario. You can model them in many different ways. Um, and they can be used to um, explain a lot of how probabilities work out. One common way is to look at the roll of a die. If you have a six-sided die and, you threw, and it's supposed to be fair, you would expect a probability distribution of something like this, which, which means that every side is equally likely. In this case, one sixth. So no matter uh, every time you throw uh, throw the die, you expect it to have equal chance of all of them. But if you were to see, for example, a, pro a die that has this probability distribution, you probably would be a little bit worried um, if you're gambling money, for example. Um, if you had to guess, I guess five is a good number since it has a 50% chance of um, uh, of landing upside side up. Uh, and before I move on from this, I just want to, another concept within uh, distributions and probabilities are the concept of drawing samples. Every time you throw a die, you're kind of realizing one sample from this probability distribution. So each time you throw the die, the die before it has landed will have to choose, like choose, uh, one of the sides that it's going to end up with, and it's based on this di probability distribution. And the same for the unloaded one. Uh, and then these are for discrete cases. So we move over to continuous cases where you have a range of numbers that can happen. Uh, we have something that is, looks more like this, uh, I hope. Or some of you might recognize this as the normal distribution, or a bell curve, or a Gaussian distribution. has a lot of names. Um, but it kind of just describes that uh, all these numbers have a s certain probability of happening. In this specific case, the zero is the most likely one to happen. Uh, and then you, you have the further away you go from zero, the less likely it's going to happen. So every time you draw a sample from it, you get something um, from this range, most likely zero, but it could also happen somewhere around. Um, for uh, an example, could be the you measure the weather in Malmo around December, and it turns out to be a normal distribution. So each day, you take the temperature, and when you take the temperature, you realize a sample or take a sa draw a sample, and it's probably going to be somewhere around here. So zero maybe, my, maybe in Malmo not that much around zero, but yeah. So um, what makes the Normal distribution so distribution so uh, special it has a lot of mathematical mathematical uses, but it comes up very naturally in a lot of different things. Like for example, height of people, um, the the time. Hmm, now I can't think of any, um, but it's a very common distribution. Anyways, you probably can think of uh, others as well. Uh, it's commonly used as a way of. Um, modeling errors when you're doing mo statistical modeling as well. All right, another example, height, as I mentioned. You see, um, I think in Sweden, the average uh, height of uh, men is around 180. So the, the, whenever you ask someone before you've seen them, you ask, how tall are you? You're most likely going to get something that is around 180 
but they could be way off because the normal distribution also allows these more extreme examples. And now, a quote before we go into the meat of it. Um, when you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. It's a quote from Lord Kelvin, a Brit British uh, physicist. Um, you might recognize Kelvin as the, the metric or s unit of scale for temperature. Why I like this quote is that it, it kind of uh, boils down the fact that whenever we know we can put a number of something, it usually um, means that we, knows, we know more about it than we would have without it. When we can tell that there is more of something or less of something, when we can quantify it, and when we can measure it in a, um, in a consistent way, that's when we can be quite certain that we know at least more than we did before. It's not always the case, but this is a good um, start for things. And this is also where I believe that data comes into the picture. It's um, why we want to um, collect data. When we know what we want to connect, we start collecting data. But the problem is usually that we have too much, at least for our brains. We, it's hard to ingest 1,000 data points. So that's why we have statistics to kind of summarize it. Um, and the most common way is to make an average out of it. So we have the average. But what does that mean? In kind of statistics term, you would call it a, a measure of central tendency. It just kind of means that it, it's, uh, it's a measure of where the middle of the data set is. But what does that mean, actually? It's a little bit ambiguous. So let's take an example here. We have a set of numbers. 0, 1, 1, and so on, up to 9. And here's one example of a uh, central uh, an average, the mean. And obviously, I've constructed the example to give a whole number here. Um, but it, it, as most of you probably know, it's just summing everything and divided by the number of data points we have. And then we have the median, which is the middle number. I hope I took the middle number now. Um, it might be three, actually. But anyways, it is the number that is in the middle when you have sorted your data. And then you have the mode, which is the most common number in the set. And this, I'm sure, is three. Oh, okay, <laughs> that's good. Um, all right, so what does that look like in a distribution? Here are the three of them when uh, model in the normal distribution. And as you can see, they're all the same. That helps, makes it easier to interpret. Whenever we hear the, the mean of a normal distribution, we can also think, oh, that also means that the most common value, i.e. the mode, is the same. And we also know that the middle value is the same. But the problem is when we come to other distributions, then these three, um, measures can be quite different. This is not even that extreme. There are more, uh, for example, power law distributions and stuff. But um, the important thing is that the, whenever we think of and hear the mean, we tend to think of them as um, interchangeably with median and mode. But in real life, there are a lot of different other distributions that uh, could be Model, modeling the data set better. And the more different they are from the normal distribution, the more wrong you would be by making that mistake of interchanging mean with median or mode. Uh, one th a common example of showing how different they can be, mean and me median, is to look into salaries. You have uh, a, a, a joke that illustrates this point. Bill Gates walks into a bar, and everyone turns into a millionaire, on average, on average. But it, it's, it, it doesn't really matter how much money the other people are making, but if you just average out, if you just spread Bill Gates' money on everyone in a bar, they're going to be millionaires because he has so much money. Explaining the joke, just in case. <laughs> um, but so, well, the first kind of problem with uh, averages. They're easily misinterpreted. 
it's not always easy to um, you might like know in a kind of uh, conceptual way why, that it is different, but when we actually hear a mean of something, it's very easy to just fall over, fall to, oh, but that means that it's also the most common one, right? Um, for example, we have you design a website and you find out that the most com the average time to go through your u work uh, user flow is five minutes. Does that mean that most people end up taking five minutes, or does that mean that the the like there is some kind of median middle point where most people take five minutes? No, it actually doesn't mean that much. We cannot interpret it in any other way because. Uh, the time that people take going through a website is most likely not going to be uh, normal distributed. Um, these things tend to be more like a power law. Uh, let's, let's not go into the power law. Um, so next, I want to uh, illustrate, just imagine that I get told you, hey, the average of my data set is three. What do you actually know about the, my data set? Um, it turns out that it could be many different things. All of these data sets have been constructed to be having the average three, but as you can see, they're very different. So, may, so it doesn't show kind of really what the spread of the data, the shape of the data, anything about what the data actually um, um, is about. And this is kind of my second point. It hides uncertainty. It hides the, the variation in the data. It hides um, all the kind of the, the useful noise that is in the data set that shows that there is variation in life. Um, let's say um, this also kind of, um, I, I, I want to mix in to this uh, concept of whenever you make guesses, you're also kind of also making an average guesstimate. Let's say you're guessing, how tall is this building? Um, then you're usually having some kind of internal model of like, okay, you buildings that look this tall, they tend to be like, you can count, okay, this is kind of two meters, then okay, that's probably 20 meters. That's also some kind of average that you have made in your head through some calculation. And it still hides the uncertainty. You say, it's about 20 meters, but what does that, how sure are you, how unsure are you? Um, this, w this way of communicating hides a lot of this uh, interesting variation. And lastly, what do we actually know? I I've hint been hitting, hinting at it a couple of times now, but what do we actually know when we know what the mean? It's actually, like for example, I tell you, it takes a, on average 100 hours to uh, learn to program. And let's not go into do, like what the definition of learning programming is, but let's say it takes 100 hours. What does that mean for me? Does it mean that uh, if I just spend 100 hours, I know programming then? Or does it mean that I should just give up after 100 hours? No, actually, it doesn't. It, it, you can never really apply the mean to a, an individual. So the average is something that is very easily misused. It, you, can, you take a group statistic and you apply it on the individual. So I've mentioned three issues I have with uh, averages, and I hope that was somewhat convincing of why averages aren't always the best tool, or seldomly, I would argue. So let's in we jump into what I believe could be improving this, what I call inter data intervals and medians as well. That helps, too. Um, so let's start with an example of what a confidence interval or a data interval. It's very related to confidence intervals, if you know anything about that. Um, let's say I have a data set, simulated of course, so it's not my real uh, running time, would be way worse anyways, um, of me running 5K. These are the timings I have throughout 100 runs. Um, hmm? uh, I, I wish I had been on 100 runs. <laughs> uh, that, that would be some, certainly some dedication. But to, to um, calculate the confidence interval, or technically we don't even have to calculate that much, we just need to sort them in order. And then let's say we want to know the 90% data interval. Like you're trying to describe 
the ninety percent of my data set is within this interval. So you just have like in this case of hundred, you just need to count like okay, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, five here. That's five from the bottom, and then five from the top. To one, two, three, four, five, and then you have your confidence interval for 90% of the data. It's easy because it's 100 po data points. I just need to count five in both directions, and then you have uh, 90. So my data interval would be 7.2, uh, I think, uh, yep, and 12.7, uh, I hope. Yes. Is it 12.5? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. I mean, it's like technicalities. It, it, this, uh, like the data data set is even numbered, so it makes it a little bit more complicated. Let's not think too much about it. But this is what my answer is. And then I forgot to mention the median, but it's just the middle point, 50, 50 points in two. Um, so with, this, with this, these three numbers, you know a lot more than just the average. You know, OK, I can expect, if I go on another run, I can expect by with a 90% confidence that the run is going to end up somewhere in this range. And by knowing the median, which is the middle point, you know how skewed the data set is. If the, if the median is closer to one side, you know that the, that side is more likely, or if it's skewed to the other side, of course. In this case, I generated it from a normal distribution, so it's in the middle and it's all easy peasy. Um, but let's just visualize it. This is the data set. It's a histogram, just showing how often different numbers come up. And here we see the confidence intervals and the median. Just by knowing these three numbers, you know where 90% of your data is. A lot more than you would know with just an average. And going back to what I showed before, um, here I show where the data interval and the median in addition to the mean is. If you don't see the mean, it means that it's the same as the median, like the, the, these two, the uniform, the normal distribution. And here we don't see the other side of the data interval because it's so far away. I didn't want to mess up the graphic. I like to have the uniform uh, x-axis. Um, okay, before I move on. So, all right, this kind of covers um, just a very quick walkthrough of confidence interval or data intervals. Um, and if we just think through, we had three issues with averages. They were easily misinterpreted. And in this case, as I said before, I can very easily interpret, like, if I go for another one, how, how likely is it that it's going to be a, a time within this? I could dis uh, calculate different times depending on how uh, sure I want to be. If I want to have the 99% uh, confidence interval, then you would have a larger range, but at least you can be more sure that you're going to have a number within this range. And then we have the hiding uncertainty. Um, confidence intervals shows very clearly how uh, the, the variation. And it is even better when you, for example, say, like the example of uh, guessing the, the height of a house uh, or the uh, building. Instead of saying it's about 20 meters, I think you can say, my 90% data interval sounds a little bit uh, arrogant, but anyways. <laughs> But you could say something like, yeah, my 90% data interval would be somewhere in between 17 and 25. Or if you're really unsure, you could say it's probably 5 or 110. Like, it really, you can really show how unsure you are on your number by telling, saying two numbers instead of one. Um, and lastly, it's, not, uh, it's way more easy to use it, and it's not as easy to misuse it because you can actually use it on individuals by thinking about it as, uh, as a distribution you can sample from. So, uh, once again, I made a mistake. What can we use this for? More than making good guesses. Um, it's one application that I, I've, I'm fascinated by. is for me, uh, for me, for my, uh, for me estimates. Um, I don't know if anyone has heard of it before. 
it's um, it's easier to explain with an example instead. How many registered cars are there in Sweden? So, if you just had to guess, where would you? Well, anyone had a, have a guess? How many registered cars are there in Sweden? Three million cars. Three million. Anyone else? Seven. Two million, three million, seven million, four. All right, all right, I like it. Already picking up. <laughs> Where's your median, yes. Uh, all right, all right. So that's one way. You can just throw out a number, but are you correct? How, how unsure of you are you? Once again, the, the same issues. But what you can do, uh, instead of just throwing out the number randomly, or randomly, uh, you could do something that is called a Fermi decomposition, where you say, hey, the number of cars you could say the population of Sweden times the percent of eligible people eligible for a driver's license, the number of people that have a driver's license, and how many cars those people with a driver's license have. And that's making some assumptions. I'm assuming that only people that have driver's licenses have cars. Um, I don't know. Some people might find that unreasonable. It, it's up to everyone, but everyone, depending on how much I think I know more about these things, or at least I'm better at estimating these numbers rather than the number of cars. And it's all about what you feel comfortable. If you know something specific or more about something else, use that instead. But the, the magic is that you can kind of decompose it and you can get surprisingly close to the correct answer and at least on the right order of magnitude if you know nothing about the number. Um, but so let's, I made it and Obviously, it looks a little bit artificial since I also looked up in the, the correct answer. But I estimated like, okay, there is about 10 million people in Sweden. Um, how many are above 18 kind of and eligible for a driver's license? 0 0.7, 0 0.7 for like out of those, 0.7, 70% have has a driver's license and out of those, they have about 0 0.8. I'm imagining like, um, Families, they usually have one or two. The, maybe uh, the, the young people have one, uh, but mo a lot of young people don't have one, and so on and so on. You, you can just kind of guesstimate your way, and I ended up with about 3.92 million. But how do I apply this with the confidence intervals or data intervals? Well, you go back to your distributions. Here, um, I mean, um, I unfortunately don't have too much time left, um, I'm already over time, so I'm not, I, I unfortunately already knew that I'm not going to have enough time to dive into this. So if anyone wants more information, just come up to me and uh, I, I can talk gush more about it. <laughs> um, but I in essence, what you do instead is that you have a formula. You know, already know the formula. I'm going to base it on the same model as before. But each, instead of each number being an exact number, you just give it a distribution. You say, hey, in this case, I think like the population of Sweden is somewhere around 9.5 million and 10.5 million. And uh, I think it's the number of eligible um, people for driver's license is around 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 and so on. And then you sample each of a, one of them, multiply them and do that 10,000 times. No, uh, as many times as you feel like. Uh, and if you do that, you end up with something like this. Another distribution, another histogram. Um, but this time you can say, you can draw another confidence interval. Say, how sure do I want to be? Um, I think I want to be 90% sure, or I want to be 50% sure. If you want to be 50% sure, then you only do 50% of the data. If you want to be 90% sure, you probably have to be, or you have to be, a, get a wider um, interval. And here I've drawn the 50 and the 90% interval. And as you can see, the true correct answer is 5 million. And our 50, my 50% 50 confidence interval with this Fermi estimation or estimate was actually wrong. But my 90% at least was correct. It did include the true number. And here you can, with by having this kind of interval and the, this, confidence interval, 
you can start incorporating how willing, how risk tolerant are you? How much am I willing to uh, gamble on being right or wrong? How important? If it's impo an important decision, then you kind of want to be more, have a wider range, but that also means that you have a very wide range compared to less, like, uh, less um, confidence. Uh, I even wrote the exact numbers, but I guess no one cares about the act actual exact numbers. All right, so let's get to back to the key takeaways. Um, I hope that you've at least started doubting averages, especially when you hear about it. Like, if you have the opportunity, question them. Ask, okay, how, how, what is the variation of the data set? And then we have the data intervals. I hope that I've shown the usefulness of it, even if um, it does take a little bit more effort. You need to have a machine to do the 10,000 samples of data. But as long as the decision is not trivial, you tend to want to be a little bit more sure and also be knowing how much of a risk you're taking. Um, here, with just averages, you have no way of measuring how unsure or how risky you're making this decision. So, if anyone is interested in more, here is some inspiration I had, and I would totally recommend further reading for these. This is the book uh, that kind of started my thinking in this, How to Measure Anything. And these are some articles that go through, as you can see on the titles, um, pretty aggressively against averages. Um, I will, I will. I was going to get to that soon, but um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. And I would like to um, ask everyone who's interested in this and finds this interesting to join our community. We have a Slack, Data Alliance Slack. And I'm also going to be posting a link to this presentation on that Slack. Um, yeah. Uh, we were act initially planning on having a break here so you could actually have time to do the, this, but. We'll see how we work this out somehow. Um, now, David is going to be speaking. No, no, please ask questions to Johnny. Oh, so oh, this oh. To work. Hey, I was trying to avoid it. Yeah. Eric. Yeah, here you go. Um, Eric. Check. Yeah. Pull up. Pushing me away. Yep. Yeah, so first of all, or I have one thought or reflection on one question. Uh, but the first reflection is, I think it was really nice the way to uh, display um, the distribution together with the uh, m median as you did. My only thought was that as I saw it, it was a little bit tricky to understand how skewed it was. So if you could combine it into some kind of mini sideways box plot, as to have it a little bit more, so you see how far away the uh, 90th percentile is uh -huh. from the median. Aha, uh -huh. yes, 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 yes. Because um, building in my head, it was a little bit tricky to understand how skewed. It. Now you also sampled from a normal distribution as you yeah, said. But yeah, uh, yeah. just start my head on working on some kind of mini. I was plot. thinking of uh, making a box plot, but uh, two issues. Uh, I didn't have enough space and time to explain it, and I didn't have the time or uh, effort to, to actually program the, the box intervals, because they mm. usually tend to be 25 and 75%, mm. while I'm arguing for 10 and 90, or 5 and 95. Yeah. And my question then is, uh, why did you choose a median if you, instead of mean for this? If you could go a little bit to that. Uh. Um, the reason is because um, the mean is not actually related to the number of um, uh, data points you have. So it, it kind of, it, it's very sensitive to outliers. And the potential problem is that if you, let's say, have a, a set of numbers of 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 10 million, then the mean would be outside of your confidence interval, which wouldn't make too much sense, I think. Well, it, it would explain that it, the, the data set is very skewed, but I think median is a more um, robust, as you would say, in statistics. Yeah, good points. Anyone else? Hi. 
Uh, what uh, my question is, uh, what are the most um, like frequent obstacles that you face when using data interval? Uh, like I um, have experience using um, the kind of data interval for robust optimization, and so it's uh, something like um, it's a lower and um, upper bound um, for the data input to do optimization. But when the, for example, uh, when the uncertainty range is too large, I don't have. Um, a solution from optimization anymore, so I have to abandon it. That sounds like a very niche application, like a very specific application. Uh, uh, yes, yes, but I'm just curious in general uh, mm -hmm. uh, what are uh, your obstacles that you um, see in your field uh, of applying data mm -hmm. for interval? I actually like it's still a very new thing, and I haven't actually put it into practice in any uh, real scenario where I have been arguing with people about this. Like you should be using this more, and this is part of the reason why I have this presentation. Uh, so I can also because it's it's live streams. So I can always just hey, if you don't know en enough about data intervals, listen to this. Listen to me talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the main I obstacle is uh, understanding. I think most people don't really haven't thought about or uh, really critically uh, examined what they actually know when they hear the mean. Uh, the average uh, accidents per day, like car accidents per day, what does that mean? Well, like, it doesn't mean that I'm going to have one today because I haven't had one in 17 years. Like, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it's knowledge, uh, like education or like education sounds so rough, but knowledge sharing. Hmm. Anyone else? All right. No more tough questions. <sighs> um, yeah, thank you very much for listening and hope you had a good time. Where do you or should I do? Yeah. Okay. Here is, is David. my uh, is my mic working? Yes. No. No. Yes. yes. The bars are going <laughs> up, so it has to be it has to be true. Unless it's going through mine. Okay, can you turn yours off? Is it still going up? Yeah. They're still going up. Look. Yeah. Okay, but big thanks, uh, Johnny, for that uh, for that talk. And uh, yeah, like hopefully we've planned this right so that this is somewhat related. I'm going to skip over an introduction, but basically I'm David Bozek, and I had a lot of free time up until recently. So I did like a little code, uh, like uh, open source open source project, and I wanted to share it with people to get some you know like some engagement on it. And then I tricked Johnny into allowing me to kind of like connect it to his talk. So, uh, so Johnny is the victim here, I think. You uh, heard it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but like I and then to get you know like to get hopefully many guests and or much attention, then I called it simulating the stock market for fun and profit because I thought that would be you know that would lead to a lot of a uh, lot of hopefully not too tough questions. But uh, yeah, like and I called it uh, uh, Volvas Arena. Uh, that's the name of the open source project. Um, so let's dive into it. I'm going to go really fast. I think we're a little bit over time, and I don't want to keep you away from pizza. Like here, that's dangerous. But um, Volva from, uh, meet, uh, from Norse mythology is basically like a female or a woman seastress, or you know, like predicting the future. And you know, like I, you know, like I can admit I'm into Vikings. So I thought, oh, that would be like a cool, a cool name for like an open source project that kind of tries to work with probability, or you know simulate things, predict things. Um, so then I asked uh, Dali, like, hey, you know, like, what would, you know, what's a, what's a more real, you know, this doesn't mean anything, you know, so what's a, what's a, what would Volva look in real, you know, like, for, for real, and, you know, like, and this is what Dali gave me. Uh, I think it's really nice. I think it should be everybody's screensaver from now on. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, like, this is, you know, this is Volva. It's an open source project. It's, you know, like, that's my, that's the GitHub where you can take a look. And it's, I mean, very quickly, like it's written in C Sharp, open source under MIT license. And it started like with an idea that, you know, like it would just sort of like simply predict the price changes of like of an asset, of a good. Uh, and then it gradually evolved like open source project or hobby projects tend to, you know, like into sort of like a trader bot battle royale kind of a thing. Um, and the current mission, again, like I think this is, you know, firmly fluid is the current mission is to be able to simply compare performance of sort of like day trading stock market strategies. So then Volva is capable of running hundreds or thousands of simulations comparing performance of different agents and uh, that work on the same data, you know, like so kind of like rerunning these. 
and then that gives lots of opportunity to expare concepts that Johnny talked about, like you know, like as confidence intervals, expected returns, average performance, and what does that really mean to be the best? I'm I'm going to be super honest. I made that up after I heard what Johnny's going to talk about. So, but still, you know, like I think I think it makes sense. I think I can pull it off. Um, but then let's let's start at the beginning. You know, like so the project started kind of like hey. We're gonna, you know, like we're just gonna simulate a price movement or price changes in something, and then let's, you know, kind of keep stock markets sort of like in the back of our heads. But here we're observing a price of something, and it's currently a hundred crowns. You know, like it's a nice round number. Um, and then let's agree that in this world, in this, you know, in this world, that the price movements are actually random. There is like a big discussion. If you know, like in the financial market, it's sort of like if you know, like day to day, or if, like if the small price movements are random or not, and mining people are trying to make money on on that. But here, here, like for the rest of the talk, we will assume that they are actually random, so we don't have to get into the into the big discussion. Um, but then we're gonna say like, hey, it's 100 crowns now. It is actually num uh, random, and we want to base it on some very simple rules, and then try to predict what it's going to be, or try to simulate what it's going to be in a month time or like in some time. Um, so the very simple rule base here is going to be, OK, so 90% of the time, nothing is going to change. You know, like, uh, and that in the stock market would be at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, the, you know, the, the, uh, the price is the same. And then we are going to have 5% of the days the price will rise by 1%, and 5% of the days the price will fall by 1%. And then you know, like our secret plan here is that we're going to try to make money on just on this variation here, uh, regardless if this is connected to sort of like a real world basis or not. So then, I mean, this is a very simple, you know, like you, you know, you you have you have your keyboard and you get itchy and you know, like you can you can simulate this very easily with such a simple rule set. Uh, so you know, like here, I simulated this thing for 200 ticks, like days or minutes or like whatever, 200 ticks, uh, 200 applications of this rule set. And then in this particular reality, it came out something like this. You know, like it started at 100, it went up a bit, and then it fluctuated a little bit, and then it ended just a little bit under, under 100. You know? And this is kind of like in Johnny's words before, like this is a sample of the dri dri distribution. This is one reality of potentially like, you know, like of many realities. Think, uh, think Dr. Strange when he was computing all of that. Yeah. Um, and then you know, this is going to be my tagline for the rest of the talk. The real magic happens when we run many of these simulations, right? And then here, like, yeah, you know, if you, you run this for a thousand times or how many ever, you know, like, then you will get something like this. So you kind of like, and here we get back to to Johnny, like in a very convenient way. So now, like, if you just look at the last value, right? You kind of have like, you know, the, the absolute maximum, sort of like the absolute minimum, and sort of like, you know, the majority of stuff happens somewhere here in the somewhere here in the middle. So very much like what Johnny was talking about. But this, you know, like this visualization itself is not terribly useful, right? Like because in this case, like we don't care about all of this, right? Like it's so then we would instead use a different tool, which is a histogram. Johnny was also using it um, of just the last value, just of the last value of the price. So then you would kind of like take that all of those n values uh, that were generated and kind of like get a histogram like this. And then kind of looking back to you know like you see sort of like a bell curve. That's a good start, right? Then you know, like we're 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 not completely completely off basis. Like we get a nice little uh, bell curve with some buckets. And here is where my connection to Johnny like come or you know like attempts to be made, right? Like so you can look at this data, like you can generate all this data point and says, hey, expected final price would be 99.752 sec, like very exact, very confident, you know, like you're you know like you're almost itching to make a bet on that, right? Um, and that's true. It's mathematically derived, right? So I'm not lying here. My previous talk was about the, li <laughs> the book, uh, How to Lie with Statistics. But this is, you know, th this would be like a great application of that. But like Johnny explained, like it's not terribly useful. And it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't tell us a lot about this. So if we look at the histogram, if we use that a little bit more, then we can say a little something a little bit more like this, you know, like so a 90% confidence interval we're 90 percent confident that the final price will be between these two values right like the 98.99 to 100.2 right now we're uh, you know like we're giving all of this well uh, johnny already told you this so this is perfect right or you could say something like hey there's a 12 percent probability that the final price would be at least five percent larger than the starting price so uh, and this is you know these are the two the two bars here that kind of like demonstrate where where we are in the in the distribution 
And then like just from, because we simulated this data, like we have all of the data, so it's easy to, you know, like it's easy to make better statements about the data than just pulling out an average and calling it a day. Here I know that, you know, like I'm expecting the data lines. This is a room full of, you know, like of people who really like numbers. So I, I have an interesting tangent. We're going to be very fast because pizza. But um, I wonder if anybody picked up on that because I didn't actually notice this myself until I was making this slide. And I was like, hmm, but this is like, this is the rule set. It's balanced, right? Like it's just as likely for the price to go up as to go down. Why is then that almost the all of the 90% confidence average lower than the starting price. Like, where does that, where does that go? Uh, so, like, why does, why does that happen? So, room full of, like, numbers, math people? Any, any, any guesses? Okay, I don't we don't have time, so I'm just going to blaze, blaze through the, uh, the slides in the interest of pizza. But basically, the problem lies in math, right? Like, science ruining everything since, like, 1543, right? So our intuition tells us, or at least my intuition, maybe I shouldn't be generalizing that, like that, but my intuition tells, uh, tells me, and even if I'm watching the news about like, the stock market or something, tells me that, hey, if something falls by 10% and then rises by 10%, then we're kind of like back where we started. Like it's back at zero, right? But it's not, like, and that's kind of like what our simulation shows us. So this is, you know, if we do the math, and this is very like envelope math, right? 100 times 90, uh, 0 0.9 is 90, 90 times like 10%, right? Like 1.1 is 99. Like we actually lost 1% here. Um, and then you're thinking, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But you know, like surely if you, but that's because like we went down first. But surely if you go up first, then this will like, like then it will be in the other way. So it's, you know, it still makes sense. The, the, <laughs> the universe, it's still at peace. Um, oh, I forgot this line. So to get, to get us back to the start value here, it would actually have to rise by 11%, 11 11.11 11 now. But no, it turns out that, you know, somewhat uh, as in life, you know, like you kind of always lose here. So uh, it doesn't work in the other direction either, right? So if the first, if it first rises and then falls, like then we have 100.1.1 is 110, and then you fall, and then you're back at 99. So it is symmetrical, but not in the way our, our intuition tells us. So like that was like an insight that I've only gotten after I've done the simulation. Um, but now, like this is my favorite. This is actually the real takeaway of the whole talk. Like, it's, uh, <laughs> so, but yeah, basically keep this m in mind. Like it's not it's not symmetrical in the way that you would think. But anyway, like Volva can then do these. You know, can apply these uh, rules and kind of like simulate the the, uh, the price of an asset as it moves through ticks, and you can get as complicated as you want here. And here I'm kind of like in the checked in GitHub uh, GitHub repo. Like then I'm using these in my own simulations. Uh, you know, like, and then there is like one for balance and one's the sort of like overall rising. So it's sort of like skewed towards stock going up, which is what generally we all hope for, for the stock market to be. And then it's also like one for falling. So then as you kind of like compare different scenarios, you can kind of say, okay, in this universe, like in this world, like what would happen if the stock market was generally rising or generally falling? Okay. So that's, you know, like now we've been simulating us price change of a single asset. Like that's, you know, that's cool. You can get some charts out, but it's not, you know, like nobody's become a millionaire from that, right? So that's, you know, we, we need to think bigger. So here, like we're still accept accepting that the short-term price fluctuation is random. Uh, we do not want to bet that the price is going to be a certain value, like either up or down, uh, like a significant chunk of uh, time in the future. We just want to profit from the, like from the short-term fluctuations. And right? that's, that's sort of like the idea of this, of this trading. So then the idea is that you can do some very simple like rule-based orders and then kind of like short-term uh, stra trading strategy orders and kind of like simulate them in this, uh, like apply those rules on the, uh, on the price changes that we've simulated. And then simpler or complex rules can be really anything as you want, you know, like it's, it's code, you can write, you get all of the context there so you can write anything, but some examples could be, Hey, you can, you, know, you can submit a sell order to the stock market for everything you have at the latest price. You, know, you just want to check out, basically. Um, or you can do like, a, hey, submit me an order to buy five assets at 2% uh, like below the latest price. And then you're kind of hoping that during the next day, during the next tick, the stock market is going to go down and you're going to succeed in kind of like buying these assets at a sale. Uh, and that, you know, that could be a valid strategy to just like wait for the, for the stock market uh, or the, for the particular stock price to just drop suddenly. 
Um, you could also say, hey, you know, like submit a sell order for all assets that would be profitably sold. Like, so you don't want to realize a loss, but you just want to profitably sell like, or realize a, a gain uh, if it's over uh, of at least 2%, right, of the latest, of the latest price. Or, and this one is kind of like my like a favorite one because in sort of like algorithm development, like if you remember from university, like the, uh, sorry, from the university, then they most likely told you something that, hey, random is actually a very useful benchmark and it's often in algorithm development, it's surprisingly difficult to beat. So here you can, you, you can totally do that. Like, you know, you can, hey, submit a buy order for a random number of shares uh, at latest price and then see what happens and see if your strategy can kind of like beat just the, you know, like monkeys throwing things at the wall strategy. And uh, surprisingly often, well, or at least I'm not super clever. So. Yeah, okay. But then we, we, have, we have one of these traders that has like a buy strategy and a sell strategy. And, you know, like that's neatly represented in code. I hope, like I wrote the code, so obviously I think so. Um, and then, you know, like we, we simulate this for a number of ticks and then we kind of, you know, like we try to determine how well did the trader bot do. So we can track, you know, like we can track these, again, we're simulating so we can track whatever we want. But here in, the, in these examples, I'm kind of like saying, okay, the number of transactions the bot did, you know, some, like some kind of like profit per transaction and it can be an average or something else. But, you know, sort of like, you know, we can just sort of like track the performance of the, of the bot. We can do like a total realized profit or total, total gain, or you could be like a number of held assets at the end of the simulated, uh, like simulation, and then seeing, you know, like how bad would it be if they were forced to sell at, the, like at that exact moment. And then you get a value, just like we had for the price movement, like then you get, you know, you get a value and say, oh yeah, now it would, in this, in this you know, like in, in this version of reality, it would have made a thousand crowns. So, you know, get, get my wallet, let's, you know, let's open. But again, like the real magic happens when we do many of these situations. And then we can, you know, like we can run many of these simulations. And then again, you know, like here, like I'm going to explain a little bit more, but we kind of get like a, you know, like a, a, I think it's like a skewed normal distribution or like a shaved uh, normal distribution. So we kind of see a bell curve. So again, like, yeah, you know, it's uh, probably something with our simulation here is right. Um, so then like when we have many of these, like we can, again, we can, we can start like we can start making some observations on the data and we can do some like better or worse statements. Uh, very much like what Johnny was teaching us. So we can say like, you know, hey, expected realized profit of this is 900 in a sec. So, you know, like each time you put it in, you know, money, you'll get 906 crowns out. So that sounds like a great, sounds like a great deal, right? Uh, but then if we, if we want to be better with data, if we want to use data better, then we can say, hey, you know, first let's explain this, this first bar. So, okay, so this particular bot will never realize a loss, right? Like it will, it will bet that the future is going to be better than the past and it will, like it will never sell something at a loss. And that can be a valid strategy or it can be a very bad strategy. But this is what this particular bot is, is doing. Um, and then we can, you know, like we could look at this like distribution and this histogram and we say, hey, we're 90% confident that the realized profit is going to be between these two numbers and this is sort of like the, num the you know, the expected, the 90% confident interval of transactions that it's going to do, that it's going to be successful at. And now with this, like I would argue that not only is this number like a lot more, you know, like, you know, like it tells us a lot more about like what to actually expect than just the, you know, just the plain, the plain average. We're also saying, showing how insecure we are in this, like how wide this is. Um, and then we can also say, hey, you know, like there is a 38% probability that this bot will realize at least 1,000 sec, so you know, like a return on investment of at least 10% or more. And that's again like kind of like this, this bar. So if you sum up everything to the right, like it has a very long tail, then uh, you know, like then we would reach 38%. So we, we're getting like you know, like by looking at this, we can make a lot more informed statements. And you know, when we when we're making our sales pitch, hopefully we can be a lot more often, uh, sorry, honest. Okay, and then finally, like the last step, I know that pizza, but uh, like then we have the arena part of Volva's arena, right? And that's basically all about avoiding this question. Like, hey, what if, you know, like what would have happened? Like what, you know, like what, uh, what could have I done different? Like, or what would have happened if I invested differently? So here, like in this, in this sort of like current version of, uh, of the open source project as it is, like then we are saying, hey, we will have many of these bots and they're going to act independently of each other uh, in parallel. So 
or in other words, they will get their you know very <laughs> very technical explanation is that they get their own instance of the simulated world. But basically, that means that they work on the same data, but they don't uh, cause interference with one another. Um, so one bot will take one u uh, use of like one buy and one sell strategy, but it uh, otherwise will have the exact same conditions as everybody else. Um, and in this way, like by running these bots in a in simulation, then we get to compare apples to apples. Like we can actually say, hey, this is you know like this is a fair comparison. This one is sort of like objectively better than the other one. Um, and here, like the, the last time today, I think, but hey, the real magic happens when we run many of these simulations, right? Many of these simulations allows us to build a statistical model with a large sample size. And then uh, Volva then takes this principle to the extreme. So then here, like as it were, looks in code right now, like then you just have, you have a, you know, like a list of uh, buy strategies and a list of sell strategies. And then Volvo will automatically for you, like it will do a Cartesian product. That basically, it will create a bot for, that will have each buy strategy and sell strategy. So you will try all of the options. So that means that when you have an idea, it's like, you know, like you're there in bed and you're reading Dagens Industry or something, and I say, oh, but this would totally work, right? Then you just write the new buy strategy or the new sell strategy, and you run the simulation, then you see like how well it would do, not just like how well it would do on, in its own, but how well it would do compared to other ideas that you've already had. And then that hopefully allows you to sort of like purge purge bad ideas that you've had before. Um, so this can get pretty large. Uh, so currently, like if you just look at what the checked-in repo has, we have 16 buy strategies and 18 uh, sell strategies. So then that makes 288 bots that then all get simulated like at the same time, comparing, comparing all of the options. And here I'm really pushing this, you know, like referring back to, uh, to Johnny's talk. But basically, like we can just say, hey, you know, like this bot has the largest average return on investment. Like this is the best one, right? Like, and you know, that's again, like it's mathematically derived. It's it's correct. It's not a lie, but it's not terribly good often. Uh, but then you can, and X is here stands for like one of like one instance of these. Um, or you can say, hey, bot X will perform best in four percent of scenarios. Now that is a lot better because it's you know it sort of like tells you okay it, it was the best one but you know like how how wide was the margin like how, how you know like did it always win like if I pick that one like am I you know like am I always going to go home rich or is it just you know if I would pick another one I would be pretty much in the same boat or finally like you know going back to confidence intervals or data intervals because this is all just data in the end right like 90% confident that it will be you know like that it will result in less than a particular number, so 2,450 crowns away from the best performer. And that's what I was kind of like referring to here in the in sort of like the what if uh, crossed out is that you know that if you go with this sort of like strategy, how far away you would be from you know, like any achievable result that you were able to come out so far. Okay, so hopefully some of that, uh, like some of that made sense. I know that I went really quickly, and I start talking very quickly, but I'm nervous, so it was double very quickly because I'm also hungry. But um, some takeaways that I hope that you remember is that communi communicating risk and confidence is very ba valuable, and it's actually quite easy if we stop to think about it. Like it's, you know, one could almost argue that just saying the average, it's, you know, it's lazy, um, and we shouldn't be lazy. And then it's easy to step away from communicating overly simplified if you have data at your disposal, which we, like, and I assume that you know the people in this in this audience do uh, most most often. Like you you have either generated the data or you've captured the data, but you have a lot of data at your disposal, so you can communicate better. Um, and then if you don't, or like you know, it's easy to have data when you generate it yourself, and that's sort of like the simulation uh, thing here. So that I'm generating the data, so I can have any data because I'm you know I'm generating and I can have as much of it as I as I want. And then finally, um, consider if components of your challenge, whatever you're currently worked on, is uh, can also be simulated or modeled, and that's sort of like bring us back to what what Johnny was also saying. Like, hey, you know, like it's actually quite easy to simulate and model assumptions. It doesn't have to be, you know, it's 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 not a huge huge work that you're gonna sit there forever, like for you know a hundred work hours to be able to sort of like generate like a model of what you're, is likely to happen. It's actually quite easy with the with the modern tools, and Volva can be done. One of the one modern tools. 
So that's, that's, those are my takeaways, but I'm very, you know, like, I'm just happy I got an excuse to talk about like the open source project. So hopefully we, you're gonna give me some, you know, stars on, on GitHub. That's really what it's all about. <laughs> and then I also couldn't step away from uh, an opportunity to give you some further reading, but there was like, if you're interested in the subject, but this was, I think these were really two really good books on the topic. So then we have Fooled by Randomness uh, from Taleb, which is the Black Swan guy that I'm sure you've, you've, you've heard the Black Swan story. And he has a book about a lot of this, how, how like the successes in sort of like investment world are actually m like a lot of the time based on luck, but nobody would ever admit that because then people don't give you more money to invest. Uh, like fantastic book. Um, and then uh, by Annie Duke, Thinking in Bets, how to, uh, how to make smarter decisions when you don't have all the facts. Again, like it's, I think, very, uh, a very good book trying to get away from like, hey, you know, like this is the, uh, you know, this is the action that yields like most likely results. So I should always take this one. And instead of sort of like saying, hey, you know, like it almost everything you know, like is a, is a throw of a die in the end. So you, you know, like you shouldn't be too certain in your decision. You should just maximize for, um, for the best possible results. So two, two great books. Hopefully you can, uh, you can pick some of, them, some of them up. And now I'm truly done. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, I would, love to, I would love to talk more about it, especially with pizza. Pizza, thanks. Yes.